This evening we're talking about the Malachite man. This is a find from near LaSalle, Utah. This has been controversial because it's a find that's not where it is supposed to be according to the evolutionary scenario. Humans in the same layer with dinosaurs. They're supposed to be 100 million years apart and they're found together or at least in the same geologic horizon. And as you can imagine, uh, there's been a great deal of controversy. There's been a great deal of misrepresentation of fact in order to explain it. Some of the conversations I've had with the head of the BLM, with some of the representatives of the evolutionary community when they did not know my position have been very revealing. The head of the BLM there at Moab called this a tar baby and he was making sure that uh, they were getting rid of it. They were shipping it off to the Smithsonian for it to be hidden. And the Smithsonian does a good bit of that. Uh, if you saw the last scene of Raiders of the Last Ark with all of those boxes back in the back of the museum, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of reality to that. But we want to see if we can find out what the actual facts are. Many of the people who do the talking and writing and uh, attempting to refute this material have never been to the site, know very little firsthand about it. I have made over a dozen trips to the site, and some of them uh, weeks at a time. And uh, I can tell you what's there. I can show you what's there. The real problem involves, of course, the story that's told by the geologic column. And I want to talk about that a little bit in the beginning because that's where the rub comes. We see the dinosaurs are supposed to be separated from man by at least 65 million years. In this case, about uh, well over 100 million years. And this scenario is supposed to represent the evolutionary picture that is recorded as you uh, as time developed, uh, as the layers were laid down, recording the development of life like a tape recorder would record a speech over millions of years, the development of life. And this is supposed to be what you find when you dig down in the earth. Leeton Judson, which is a standard geology textbook, physical geology, says because we cannot find sedimentary rocks representing all of Earth time neatly in one convenient area, we must piece together the rock sequence from locality to locality. And many people think that when they see this geologic column, beautifully represented in the textbooks, this is what you find. But you cannot find all of this in one convenient area. It has to be pieced together or correlated. The process of tying one rock sequence in one place to another in some other place is known as correlation. It's co-related based on presuppositions, not necessarily where it's found, but often philosophical presuppositions. But we want to make the point, as emphasized here in the Encyclopedia Britannica, the end product of correlation is a mental abstraction called the geologic column. It's not, if you pardon the pun, concrete. It's not in the rock. It is a mental abstraction that is constructed or correlated. Derek Eager answers the misconception that some people would have. Well, you can easily build this by dating the rocks, and then you stack it according to the dating. When he made this statement, he was president of the British Geological Association writing a new scientist, he said, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method for dating and correlating rocks in which they occur. How do you correlate, determine which goes on top and which goes on bottom, piece together this geological sequence? By the fossils. And then he says, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date the fossils. That is, in terms of correlation, to determine which goes on top and which goes on bottom. It's the fossils. Well, now, how do the fossils allow us to correlate? Well, let's let the evolutionists describe how this happens. Putman and Bassett in their geology textbook express it this way. A rock that had an early form of an organism was clearly older than rocks containing later forms. Now, notice the assumption of evolution in the description. This is a, quote, early form. Well, since it's an early form, then you know where to put it. If you're an evolutionist, don't you? Where would it go? 
wouldn't go on top. Furthermore, all rocks that had the, quote, early form, no matter how far apart those rocks were geographically, would have to be the same age. Why? Because of the assumption that they lived at this time, and then millions of years later, others lived, and you stack it according to that assumed sequence. In this way, our geologic timetable came into being. Here's the early form. Here's the later form. Those that have the same form are stacked together. Not where they are, but how they relate to early and late. With, in this way, our geologic timetable came into being. Without the theory of evolution and the interdisciplinary science of paleontology, it could not exist. Now, this may be somewhat of an overstatement of the issue, but this is the way the evolutionist describes it, and certainly the beautiful, uh, perfect, detailed geologic column that we see in the textbooks could not exist without the philosophical assumption of evolution. Now, when you have to assume the evolutionary scenario in order to build it, can you then turn around and use what you have built to prove evolution? Well, this is exactly what they do. Look at the textbook. Here is the column. See the sequence. See, that proves evolution, and that convinces a lot of people. But it's not something concrete that you find. It's a mental abstraction that's built that you couldn't build without first assuming evolution, that is, in its complete and perfect form. R. H. Rastel expressed it this way in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It cannot be denied that geologists are here arguing in a circle. The succession of organisms has been determined by a study of the remains embedded in the rocks, and the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the organisms they contain. Now, to again, somewhat exaggerate the, or, or the, the, the fallacy, but still illustrate what we're talking about. Here's a person who says, we have a primitive fossil, which would, of course, go at the bottom of the column. How do you know this is a primitive fossil? Well, it's found in an old rock. Okay, I can understand that. But how do you know that this is an old rock? Well, it's got a primitive fossil in it. Now, what have we proved here? <laughs> this is useless as proof. Now, it's not useless per se in science because if we understand that we're not proving something, it's useful as a model, as an illustration of the concept. When we look at the geologic column, we see an illustration of the model. Now, I need to emphasize when I say this is built on circular logic that I'm not saying that there is no general order or sequence in the column. I think we see, underscore general, the kind of order that we see so that you can recognize Cambrian animals, that there is a suite or group of animals that you find together commonly that's called Cambrian animals. They, they form that collection. I think it's because of natural habitat. They lived at the bottom of the ocean. And if we're looking at a flood deposit, which I think is the best explanation of the geologic column of the fossil record, then the things that lived lowest would be buried first, and uh, then you would find things that lived higher buried next as the catastrophe proceeded. Over a, a series of a year, a year-long series of catastrophes would basically bury things where they lived, and we would expect and predict a general order that would segregate, not by time, but by natural habitats. Things would not be buried together, not because they're millions of years apart, but because they don't live together. Normally today, you don't find uh, bears and lions buried together, though they're similar in a lot of ways. Uh, both mammals, they, they don't live in the same places. You certainly wouldn't expect lions to be buried together with a coral reef uh, because of the imposition uh, of natural habitats. And so we see a general order, but the order that is described here in the textbooks is grossly misrepresented, skewed, and distorted. 
I can say that for a number of reasons. Uh, apart from the circular logic to build the detail that we see in the, the, the beautiful column, we see the fact that most of the column, most of the fossil record is clams. They're marine invertebrates. It's just clams, clams, and more clams rather than these impressive vertebrates that we see generally represented in the geologic column. These are the index fossils that allow you to identify the particular layers, and they're typically marine invertebrates. 95% of all fossils are marine invertebrates. Now, you don't, you don't hear that in most geology classes. Somebody might get the idea we're looking at a, at a marine catastrophe here. Uh, that's not told. Of the remaining 5%, 95% marine invertebrates, 5% left, 95% of that involve algae and plant fossils. And then 95% of the remaining one quarter of a percent are other invertebrates. We haven't got to the vertebrates yet. The remaining about one one hundredth of one percent are vertebrates, and most of those are fish. Well, you can see how a marine catastrophe would fit the picture here a whole lot better than what you see represented in the geologic column. Only about one one hundredth of one percent are vertebrates. More than 95 percent are marine invertebrates. And for this reason and a number of other reasons, the founding fathers of geology reached a very different conclusion from what the philosophical position today uh, causes geologists to talk about. Nicholas Steno is known as the father of modern stratigraphy. He's a hero in all of the geology textbooks. If you want to pass stratigraphy, you have to memorize his 12 axioms. When I was lecturing there at A&M recently, we mentioned this, and uh, the professor said, yes, we all know that, and the teacher rattled off all 12 of them. But she had no idea what the basic thinking about geology was from Nicholas Steno. But quoting from Evolution of the Earth, a standard geology textbook by Doughton Batten, we read, besides correctly interpreting fossils, Steno drew some even more important conclusions about the strata in which they occur. The result was the formulation of the most basic principles for analysis of Earth history. He showed great insight. Now, remember that he showed great insight. He understood the geologic record and wrote the rules that we're still using today. He continues saying, Steno's axioms provide the ultimate basis of practically all interpretation of earth history. All interpretation of earth are right there in his axioms. So the importance can hardly be overemphasized. What they don't tell you is what I saw in the, uh, one of the original editions of his book when I was doing work at Cambridge in England, where that early edition was open to the fly piece dedicated to the proof of the Noachian deluge. He believed it was done by a year-long series of catastrophes. And he understood it well enough to explain all the basic principles, virtually all interpretation of earth history is in his description, in his axioms. Oh, this flood geology business is nonsense. It won't work. Nicholas Steno is a very eloquent and powerful refutation of that nonsense. And that's a nice way to put it. Building on that work, along with others intervening, Henry Morris, John C. Whitcomb wrote the book The Genesis Flood, which I think was the most influential factor in spawning the creation movement. Uh, and, by the way, we have his daughter with us tonight, Henry Morris, daughter. Uh, they attend here with us regularly from time to time. We're not mentioning this just because she's here, but this is in my lecture all the time. I didn't add it just for you. I think it's very interesting to look at the forward to this book, written by John C. McCampbell, who's professor and head of the Department of Geology at the University of Southeastern Louisiana. 
He's an evolutionist. But he wrote the foreword to this book, which explains geologic history in terms of the catastrophic Genesis flood. And he acknowledges that the facts of geology fit. Now, certainly, Steno's interpretations and his axioms demonstrate that as well. But the head of one of the, the leading geology schools in the country acknowledges that, and that they build a strong case for this interpretation, and furthermore, he said that they present a serious challenge to the present uniformitarian view. While that uniformitarian view has waned and is virtually fallen out of favor since this book was written, I think it had a great deal to do with that, though those who would be leaders in that departure from uniformitarianism would probably deny it. Nevertheless, most, uh, or at least a large majority of geologists today are catastrophists which this book advocates. They were not when this book was written. I think it has had a tremendous impact. I think flood geology, I think that's a good explanation of the ge geologic column. I think it is a flood deposit, though this picture is not anything like what you see when you dig down in the earth. This is a skewed, constructed, conceptual correlation what you actually see is clams, clams, and more clams with a general order reflecting where they lived. But how do we test this scenario that bases its, uh, its, its concept on circular logic? Circular logic is useful in doing science. This is what we do when we form a hypothesis, a model. We assume the thing to be proved. We may draw pictures, illustrations of it. Now then, the appropriate use of it is to compare that with the real world and see if the facts fit. It's inappropriate to use it as proof, but test it with the real world to see if the facts fit. And a general fit wouldn't work in this case. If you're explaining this segregation in terms of separation by millions of years, you don't allow for exceptions. <laughs> In terms of natural habitat, there would be some exceptions, but a general order predicted. But the testing uh, of this circular logic, this illustration of the model by the geologic column, can be done by what are called topsy-turvy fossils. Stephen Stanley of Johns Hopkins University coined this term. And he says they would disprove evolution. Any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory. Now, what does he mean by topsy-turvy fossil? Something that's supposed to be on the bottom that's found up at the top, or something found at the top supposed to be at the bottom. That's a topsy-turvy fossil. Now, it so happens that many of the things that are supposed to be exclusively at the bottom are found at the top, uh, not in the intervening ages, which would indicate extinction, according to the evolutionary interpretation, but they're found alive, even though in the geologic column you only found, find them way down in the column. That's a part of this topsy-turvy concept. Notice the description here in the prehistoric atlas of what are called living fossils. And he says they're numerous organisms, present-day fauna and flora, which can be regarded as living fossils. One of the best known among them is Neopolina, the only living representative of a class of mollusks thought to have been extinct for 350 million years before 1957, when Neopolina was caught off the coast of Costa Rica. 350 million years of rock layers, and you don't find anything, and plenty of them down below 150 million years, according to the evolutionary interpretation, and they're alive. Well, now, their view is they're separated by 350 million years. They've been gone a long time. They just resurrected. No, I think the interpretation is wrong. Niles Eldridge, in his book on fossils, describes living fossils and acknowledges the problem. He says, there seems to have been almost no change in any part that we can compare between living organisms and its fossilized progenitors of the remote geological past. He says, we have not completely solved the riddle of living fossils. They're supposed to evolve. They're supposed to be extinct. 350 million years, nothing. And there they are. 
That doesn't fit. That falsifies the concept of extinction when they disappear in this column. One of the more famous, best known, living fossils would be the coelacanth. This is a rather strange looking fish that was once thought to be a perfect link. These lobed fins uh, look maybe like they're growing into legs, except we found them alive and found out they're just real good fins and allow them to turn on a dime and excellent swimmers. Here in the book, Living Fossil by Keith Thompson, who was president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, it says, off the coast of Southern Africa in the winter of 1938, a fishing boat with the Nirene called the Nirene, dragged from the Indian Ocean near the Chaluma River, a fish thought to be extinct for 70 million years. It happens to be the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs, virtually. The fish was a coelacanth, an animal that thrived concurrently with the dinosaur. What's the evidence for the extinction of the coelacanth? Exactly the same that you have for the extinction of the dinosaurs. For 70 million years, no fossils. They weren't extinct, according to the interpretation, since you don't find them from that point on up. We, find, uh, uh, we have found over 600 of them now. And uh, in fact, uh, two more populations have been recently found. Another excellent example is the horseshoe crab. We're looking in the upper portion of a moder at a modern, modern horseshoe crab, which is very common. When I lived in Panama City, you could just see them all over the place out there. They were a, a nuisance. And here is the fossil down in the lower part that looks for all the world just like it. Keith Thompson describes this. He said, the first members of this group appeared some 420, 24 million years ago in the Silurian and looked quite like modern forms. The last fossils became, became extinct about 50 million years ago. Uh, I'm sorry, fossils don't become extinct. They, <laughs> but I know what he means. Uh, we find them as fossils according to their interpretation, 50 million years ago, and nothing since then. And they're just all over the place. They're not even rare, to say the least. And there are hundreds of examples. Sometimes, when we know those things are happen and are common, they just you don't worry. The logic, though, falsifies the concept. There are so many of them, they just seem to get numb to that. But some of them really aggravate. How many know what we're looking at here? The little hacksaw blade critters are very important fossils, uh, especially for petroleum geologists. These are, are graptolites, and the various species allow you to identify a certain level. They lived, I think, at different temperatures and at different uh, environments in the ocean um, and allow petroleum geologists to, to order uh, their search. But notice the statement by Sue Rigby of the British Geological Survey, writing in Nature, all paleontologists dream of finding a living fossil, and uh, in reality, it would be a nightmare. But Noel Dilley, they say, it seems has done so, as graptolites are arguably the most important zone fossils of the lower Paleozoic. In other words, when you find this one, that says 570 to 360 million years. That's the way you determine that layer. That's how you correlate when you find that, you know that's at least 360 million years ago. They found them alive. What are they doing alive? Doesn't that falsify the concept of extinction when they disappear in the column? I just think they lived there. They didn't live higher. And when the flood deposit buried them, they didn't live any higher and didn't get buried any higher. And so the fact that they're still alive doesn't surprise me a bit. It fits our view perfectly. It does not fit theirs. Notice the recent statement. This is just uh, about a year old in science. A bunch of sea urchins turned up in the Cretaceous like a big penny millions of years after they were believed to have been gone extinct. Their reappearance cast doubt on the existence of one long presumed mass extinction. Well, uh, <laughs> I can understand that. Why did they think there was a mass extinction? Well, here were just tons of these things, and they're gone, and you don't find them anymore. And there they are again. Well, maybe they didn't go extinct after all. Does, is that hard to figure out? Fifteen of the 29 species, apparently extinct genera, reappeared. Another seven, so much uh, like, uh, like them later appeared. 
therefore, must not really have gone extinct. You think? <laughs> Isn't that pretty obvious? The idea of extinction when they disappear in the column is falsified over and over and over again, and it's in every textbook you can pick up on geology. They just repeat it over. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. The topsy-turvy fossils refute, but there's so many of them, they've just apparently become numb. We'll look at one more here, at least one more. David Noble was out on a holiday hike when he stepped off the beaten path into the prehistoric age, standing amid trees thought to have disappeared 150 million years ago. Puts him right in the middle of Jurassic Park. The discovery is the equivalent of finding a small dinosaur still alive on the earth, said Carrick Chambers, director of the Botanical Garden. Wouldn't that be neat to find us? What's the difference? Not a bit. We do that all the time. And it wouldn't surprise me if we were to find a dinosaur still alive. What's the evidence that they're gone? Same evidence for the coelacanth. Same evidence for this tree. And so how do you know they won't find it? You don't know. There is good evidence that you don't know in spite of what they claim. Interestingly, we do have some, I appear to be very credible eyewitness accounts of something like a Brontosaurus in the Congo, Makili Mbombo, uh, we can't say that's verified. We've got some fuzzy pictures. We need some better ones. There are several expeditions uh, making that effort. And uh, by the way, a number of evolutionists who are spending millions of dollars in that effort. Uh, and in Papua New Guinea, there are very credible accounts of Pteranodon, pterosaurs, uh, that are about this size as represented here in the diagram. And I'm not able to divulge all the details, but we do have a fuzzy picture. I won't say this proves it. It has obviously been uh, computer enhanced to death. Uh, but there it is. They're nocturnal creatures. It was taken at night and computer enhanced. And the eyewitness says it was very clear, and that's the photograph. Well, mm, that's what it looks like. We need better pictures. Uh, and we hope to give you more detail on that later on. Why wouldn't you find that? Well, you find that kind of thing all the time. Well, that's part of what we'll be doing in Papua New Guinea in February. So we find things that are supposed to be down up all the time. Well, that doesn't impress them a whole lot because they're just a bunch of it. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's good logic, a good reason to ignore it. They just don't have an answer. As Eldred says, we don't have any answer to this riddle. We haven't solved the riddle. But they do acknowledge that if you do it the other way, what's supposed to be up down, that would be good evidence. But then they do a lot of tap dancing there as well, as we'll see. But this is where they say you should really concentrate. If you want to test the model, the theory, then you find things that are supposed to be up down. Notice the way it's described by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Blind Watchmaker. We should be very surprised, for example, to find fossil humans appearing in the record before mammals are supposed to have evolved. Humans before mammals, that's, not, that's what's supposed to be up, down. If a single, well-verified mammal skull were to turn up in 500 million year old rocks, our whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. Now, that's a pretty flat-footed statement, and you might wonder why he's saying that, but there's a good reason for that. One of the, the primary criterion of science involves falsif falsification or testability. If something is not at least potentially falsifiable, it's not science, and that's a concept that maybe the average individual is not used to, but basically what it says is you have to be able to test it. Now, if you just, by circular logic, arrange this and say, see, that's the way it is. Well, you'd expect it to be that way because that's the way you arranged it. You, you, that's a tautology. Well, how do you test that? Well, he says, no, it's not just a tautology. You can test it, and here's the test, you see. And it's necessary for him to come up with that in order for it to be science. Otherwise, he's just playing games, and he realizes that. 
And so he says, here is my chin out. This would utterly destroy, and he has to do that in order to have something besides a tautology for his argument. So if we were to find a modern-day alley-oop, <laughs> uh, this picture, by the way, was taken out in our Ann, Texas, where the inventor or author of alley-oop lived, and uh, that's Denny that alley-oop used to ride around on. If you found one in real life or evidence in the fossil record, then that would refute it. That would knock it out of the water, or as he put it this way just about a year ago, writing in Free Inquiry, referring to some alleged human bones and carboniferous coal. I'm not personally familiar with this. I know a little bit about it, not enough to say anything, and so I won't venture an opinion on it, but he acknowledges the implications if it were found. If authenticated as humans, these bones would blow the theory of evolution out of the water. And so if you find human bones down where they're not supposed to be, ball game's over. We can go home. Evolution would be wrong, according to the leading authorities who are often more scientific in their thinking than the average individual. Well, that's what we've got, almost precisely, with the Malachite man. Here we have human bones in the lower Cretaceous, the Dakota sandstone, found back in the early 70s. Here, pictured by Lynn Ottinger, who did not find them, but he stumbled across them after they were uncovered by Dave Fuller a few days earlier, who had covered them back over, was waiting for officials to get there, and Lynn stumbled on them. But nevertheless, there are parts of two perfectly modern individuals 50 feet down in the Dakota Sandstone, supposed to be 140 million years old. This is the same formation that we find at Dinosaur National Monument. Now, Dinosaur National Monument is a big monument, covers a lot of area. Where the visitor center is, we have the layer just below that, the Dakota Sandstone. But in many places throughout Dinosaur National Monument, you find outcrops of the Dakota Sandstone. And the Dakota Sandstone, as well as the Morrison, all are known for their dinosaurs. And both of them are well represented at Dinosaur National Monument. This is a, a map uh, put out for tourists in the Moab area, which is about 20 miles from this find, not the same area, but gives you some idea of the geology. And if you're familiar with Moab, you know it's right in the middle of a big fault. You see the Entrada Formation up here at the top. Here's the Entrada Formation down at the bottom over here. This fault slipped up. This, of course, was down here, and it slipped up. But here is the Dakota sandstone. Here is the Morrison that we were looking at. And the bones that we're talking about here are in the Dakota. This would be about 140 million years ago, according to the evolutionary interpretation, right in the middle of the dinosaur period that became extinct 65 million. So 140 million is, is uh, certainly in the middle of that period. As we've suggested, I've made a number of trips to the site. This picture was taken just a few months ago with the present owner, Bill Harrison. It is an open pit copper mine, at, uh, or has been in the past. Bill is now uh, taking the azurite and malachite nodules from the site. This shows a wide area, and unfortunately, many people who go there don't back up and look at the broader geologic context. We can see the layers going all the way across here. And we're looking at three different levels in this picture. This excavation was done during the mining operation of the 30s. They got to very hard rock, which you can see here at the edge, the bottom extent of that excavation that was tearing up their bulldozers. And so they stopped, even though it was a very, very profitable copper mine at the time. Uh, in the 70s, they began again and came on down, and this excavation, the second level, is the result of the excavation in the 30s, taking it on down some 50 feet. Uh, the road level is still down further than that. Uh, that road was excavated in the 30s. And it was at this site, 50 feet down, that these human skeletons were found. Dave Fuller was driving the bulldozer 
Actually, his father drove the bulldozer for the excavation back in the 30s. And uh, he, you know, at the time this picture was taken, was head of uh, San Juan County Roads. He's now retired. But he showed us where, when he was driving the bulldozer, he came across these bones. He said there were no broken layers. It was completely undisturbed, and he had taken it down some 15 feet from the point at which they had stopped in the 30s so that he was down a total uh, of about 50 feet at that point. Here with Bill Harrison, he described in detail exactly what happened and uh, the entire context. Here is a profile, a side profile. We see the road cut. We were taking the picture from over here a moment ago. And uh, this is the way it looks at present. This is where the skeletons were found. Now this uh, was the, the original excavation. This was the excavation of the 70s. This is the road cut in the 30s. Now this is a picture from that perspective. Go back up and see here's actually this portion of it that you'll be able to look at. We're not looking at the road cut in that picture. Here is the upper section uh, where the, th the 30s excavation was done. This is the 70s section here. So you can see the two-tiered effect, mining operation of the 30s and then of the 70s here from the side. And this is the way it looks in profile. Prior to the excavation of the 70s, and just months before the find, it looked like this. And there, the skeletons were somewhere between 15 and 20 feet down from the surface of the 70s excavation, and of course still further down from the uh, excavation of the 30s. Uh, 150 feet from the road cut. Typical of the Dakota sandstone are extremely hard sandstone layers and then semi-lithified layers. You can dig in it with a pocket knife. It's certainly much more than loose sand, but it's, and it's, it's rock and uh, certainly qualifies as that, but it's not extremely hard in between and they're alternating layers and if you know anything about the Dakota sandstone throughout the area for hundreds of miles that's typical of the Dakota sandstone alternating hard and semi-lithified sandstone. Before 1930 when the road was cut before they began the mining operation this is the way it looked and at that point the skeletons are 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone, 150 feet from the road cut. Prior to the road cut, it looked like this. And the road cut was formed, as we've suggested, in 1930. And you can see the continuing layers on the other side of the road picking up right where these layers left off. We acquired an aerial photograph of the area that was taken about the time of the road cut, just shortly afterwards. Here is the property owned by the mining company. This is the road that was cut in 1930. Prior to the time the road was cut, this hill just continued right across, but obviously the road bisected that. Uh, and then the mining operation began. We'll look at a close-up, and there we see the road and the property. The 30s excavation covered this area and then the 70s went further down in this area as it approached the road. Uh, but prior to that excavation, that material, uh, and pr prior to the road cut, it was continuous all the way across. Radiocarbon dates of the bones have produced a variety of dates. 210 years for UCLA carbon dates uh, in radiology. 1,450 years was published in the Journal of Utah Archaeology there's a wide range. There's a, a spring that percolates right down through the middle of this, leaching and adding material, and so we would expect a wide range and not accurate dates because material is continually being added and leached, and the bones are replaced in varying degrees with other minerals, and so that indicates things are being added and things are being taken away, which would uh, obviously not make for good radiocarbon dates. But if it's older than 1930, you see, that's the ballgame. If it's older than 1930, 
it's 50 feet down with no access, unless you're going to go through these extremely hard layers, and that's not something somebody would do. You might tunnel through some of the side layers, but the tunnel at this point would have to come from at least 200 feet away. The bones themselves vary in the degree of replacement. Some of them are almost modern looking, as are many very old bones. Many dinosaur bones are fresh. Some of them are almost completely replaced, as is this bone. This bone had, I personally excavated, washed it off with a canteen. It had been out of the ground less than five minutes when I was holding it here and the picture was taken. It's a vibrant green. And from the flesh tones there, you can tell that that's, that's a pretty good rendition of the color of those bones replaced by a, a copper salt uh, by malachite. Some of them are turquoise, which likewise is a salt associated, a, a, a copper salt associated with copper. And here is a jawbone that is just perfectly replaced, held by Joe Taylor, whom some of you know. The teeth are jewelry grade turquoise. Sorry, that's just Turquoise, perfectly replaced. I don't think that's a modern burial. And I think the more you look at that, the more obvious that is. And uh, I did mean to bring some of those bones. Unless I left it in the car, I didn't get here with them. But I do have some of the bones that are available for you to examine. And it's hard replaced bone. This is the site, the particular spot, where the bulldozer uncovered the first finds, and then Lynn Ottinger stumbled across it days later, in, uh, toward the road, uh, down at the, the level that had been reached by the 70s excavation. This is a picture that was taken uh, at that time, back in the early 70s. Uh, pictures appeared, uh, and uh, articles appeared in a number of magazines, I think, giving a fairly accurate rendition uh, of what had been found and of the obvious problems that were involved. Lynn Ottinger was the one that stumbled across this days later. He was leading a rockhound group, and they were collecting minerals, and they stumbled across these bones. <clears throat> and if he looks like he ought to have what me worry written across the bottom here, I, you have, uh, well, that, I wouldn't disagree with that. But he called these bones the Moab man. He's a very unique, eccentric individual, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I don't think they should be called the Moab man for a number of reasons. First, this is Lynn Ottinger's term, and Lynn was not the discoverer. He had no right to the bones. It wasn't his property. The bones didn't belong to him, though he confiscated the bones and sold them for $10,000. They weren't his. Uh, a lot of people have been prosecuted for less than that. Uh, he's fortunate that he wasn't, but his, his role was certainly not an honorable role in this manner. And furthermore, there have been 10 skeletons now found. He found, the or he'd stumbled across, after they had been found, the first two. And so he's completely unrelated, not directly, not, it wasn't the finder, the first two, and completely unrelated to 80% of the find. And so I don't think uh, he is a principal in this matter at all. And furthermore, they're not that close to Moab. There are lots of cities closer. LaSalle would be by far the closer. It's about uh, oh, four, maybe five miles away. Moab is well over 20 miles away. And therefore, I think it's appropriate to disassociate the bones from Lynn Ottinger and the term Moab man. Now, here's my wife holding the same bone in the same spot. <laughs> the Creation Evidence Museum has the exclusive excavation rights that they have acquired from the owner of the property. Uh, they have designated the bones the Malachite man. They're stained uh, and replaced with Malachite. And uh, I think that's a much more appropriate designation for the reasons we have suggested. This is where the 70s find was. The finds of the 90s, where the rest of the bones were found, were found more at this location. And the entire site of where they were found is at roughly the same level but over an area 50 by 100 feet. So it's a, a very broad area where they're found, not in one spot. 
This is a picture taken by some of the archaeologists who were involved in the excavation of the 90s that I obtained from the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management. The blue flag there in the center shows you the spot where two skeletons were found. And also you can see the undisturbed nature of the rock in which they're found. Looking at a closer view, you can see actually some of the bones sticking out of the ground here at this spot. There's another skeleton over there where they're working. But this is typical of the undisturbed, semi-lithified uh, middle layer, if you please, of the Dakota sandstone. Looking closer, you can see she's excavating this bone that is embedded in the rock. Here we see she's taking it down further, and uh, now we see another knee over here showing up. This is one of the few, actually only two, were articulated. They weren't completely articulated. The lower portion, that is, was together as in life. Most of them were just bones piled into place, not articulated. But this one was. We can see the pelvis here. And this shows the process of revelation as the, uh, the rock was moved away. Here she's brushing away some of that which has been excavated. Here's the femur, uh, the foot. Here's the pelvis over here. And then as it's further excavated, you can see the pelvis still embedded in the rock. Here is the, the second leg behind here, still uh, even more embedded, as this one is being disclosed. Now, as you look at the previous uh, pictures, you can see the process. Here is where it started, and they begin to uncover taking this out of the rock. And you can actually, as, as it were, be there and see this being revealed. This was the nearby skeleton. I say skeleton. This is a pile of bones. These are not associated. These two may look like they go together like a knee. This is a femur, but this does not go with the femur any more than these two. These were just washed into place, and this is a pile of ribs, not necessarily oriented as in life, but in general, but not, uh, certainly not articulated, which is typical of most of the finds. This is the hole that was left when those two skeletons were removed. Again, you can see the undisturbed nature of the semi-lithified rock out of which they were dug. They were entombed in that rock, and they were excavated from that rock. Uh, these pictures were not mine. They were from the BLM, uh, pictures that they took of the excavation. I took this one earlier this spring. This is that spot. It's been cleaned up and... Uh, uh, the backhoe marks can be seen there, but it does reveal the context. He's standing right about the spot where those skeletons were found. They haven't taken it further back. They're hoping to. They've got to remove the top. It'll cave in on them if they don't. Uh, but this is rot. You can also see the harder layers up above. Uh, this is what the bulldozers ran into. This is the base of the 30s excavation. And this, of course, is the base of the 70s excavation and the spot where the skeletons were found. We took the bones to William R. Maples, who perhaps or was perhaps the leading forensic anthropologist in the world. He wrote the book Dead Men Do Tell Tales. He was famous for cracking the Bundy case. Uh, his lab was in charge of all the Vietnam remains. He was the one who identified Anastasia, her bones. Perhaps the most famous forensic anthropologist in the world. He established and ran, the, and, uh, ran until his death the C.A. Pound Human Identification Laboratory as a part of the University of Florida, part of the uh, museum system there. And he agreed to and did examine two of the skeletons that we carried to him. He says in answer to the objection that some had made, these were just Indians that had been buried, <laughs> if buried before 1930, 50 feet down through those hard layers, which wouldn't make a lot of sense, but that's the claim. He says the skeletons show no conclusive Indian characteristics. There were some that you could point to, as some had, but you see that in the general population, and anyone, he says, that uh, says these are necessarily Indians just doesn't know what they're talking about. That isn't the case. 
He also pointed out that the skeletons had no collagen in them, and that's a quick and dirty way to determine if they're hundreds of years old or thousands of years old. You take a match, you light the end of it, you smell. And uh, he said there was no collagen there, which would indicate thousands of years as opposed to hundreds of years. This was also confirmed recently uh, by Mike Armitage in a journal publication uh, using a scanning electron microscope showing that there was no collagen in the bones, which would certainly indicate that it wasn't a recent burial. Well, how do we explain this? What's the most reasonable explanation? You've pretty well uh, assimilated the facts. Is it a mining accident? That's probably the standard answer that's being given today. Well, there's some very obvious negative indications of that. First, there's no evidence of tunnels. Zip, nada, <laughs> it's not there. I had one archeologist point to what was a solution cavity that was produced by the spring in the middle. It wasn't associated with the bones, wasn't anywhere close to them, and it was you know, maybe three feet in diameter and went back maybe three or four feet into uh, the cliff, but it was a solution cavity and certainly not a tunnel, and certainly it would go in the wrong direction, and uh, I don't think they were really serious in their proposal. Apart, you would have to have a tunnel 200 feet long, and. Uh, You'd see evidence of that somewhere. They're dispersed over the wide area of 50 by 100 feet, which doesn't sound like a group huddled together in a mining accident. If it happened after 1930, we would have known about it. Ten people killed in a mining accident after 19... I don't think you'd have had something that obscure that nobody would have known about. If it was before 1930 then you'd have to have a tunnel 200 feet long and there's no evidence of it. And the, the one who was driving the bulldozer uh, just devoutly affirmed that there was no cracks, there was no break in the layers anywhere. There were four females and an infant in the total of 10, which doesn't sound like a mining operation, does it? Sound like a group of people that got caught in a catastrophe, washed into place. There were no crushed bones. If you got a mining accident, you got crushed bones. No tunnels, widely dispersed. The tunnel would have to be 200 feet long, no evidence of it. An infant, four females, and no crushed bones. As we say in Texas, that dog just won't hunt. That just won't fly as an explanation. And <laughs> top it off, no tools. Then all kind of screening, you saw some of the screens that were there uh, in, in the foreground of the excavations in the 90s. Uh, Lynn Ottinger himself said he spent three weeks screening the entire area, found zip, nothing, no tools. That just doesn't look like a mining accident. Well, could it have been a recent burial, which is what some have suggested? Well, there are just all kinds of negative indications here. 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone, under undisturbed hard layers, now, some people like to bury them pretty deep, I guess, but now that's a little absurd. And why would you, <laughs> through rock that was tearing up bulldozers, several layers of that hard, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Most of the skeletons were not articulated, which is what you would expect for a recent burial. The degree of mineral replacement is likewise counter-indicative of a recent burial. The range of radiocarbon dates up to 1,400 years, and no collagen it is just virtual proof these are not recent burials. Now, what could it have been? Well, maybe an ancient burial. Here, all of these factors then become positive indications, don't they? An ancient catastrophic burial, like Steno talked about, 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone, well, if you saw Jurassic Park, you'd understand why humans normally wouldn't be found around those things. But if you ever find them together, you know it's not because they're 100 million years apart. They lived in different places. But here, uh, together, under, under the hard layers, buried in the catastrophe would be a kind of thing we'd expect. Some articulated, perhaps, most unarticulated, the fact that there's no collagen 
and the range of radiocarbon dates is exactly what we would predict. That model fits. A catastrophic ancient burial, not recent, fits this picture. In fact, maybe we can best explain it with a cartoon I saw the other day that looked like this. These were them <laughs> that were buried in the catastrophe that missed the boat. The evidence summarized then involves first realizing this column that's causing all the problem, that's causing people to work so hard to say this can't be what it looks like it is, is simply a conceptual correlation to start with, and its purpose is not proof, and it's not in concrete, it is to be used as a test, and here it fails the test. Living fossils abundantly falsify the concept of extinction, which is fundamental to the building of that column. And the evolutionary progression is falsified. This is the chin out test, the potential falsification for the, uh, for the theory as proposed by Dawkins. And it is falsified by the Malachite man, where we have 10 humans in the layer, not dinosaurs at this place, but in that layer, uh, a good ways away, certainly up at Dinosaur National Monument in the same layer. And by the way, the fact that that layer continues for over a thousand miles is also an indication of a catastrophe, not of local extent, but continental extent. Likewise, the Morrison Formation is thousands of miles in extent. These are continental layers. They're not local deposits. And some of them are literally global and can be traced around the globe. Fossil footprints of man and dinosaur are found the Burdick Track, the Taylor Trail, the McFall Trail, some of you have heard us talk about from Texas, New Mexico, Utah, Turkmenistan. Indian dinosaur petroglyphs likewise falsify uh, the evolutionary progression from Utah and Colorado and Arizona. Uh, Peruvian and Mexican dinosaur artifacts in the form of burial stones, pottery, fabric, figurines, the cat track some of you have seen, the fossil finger, the iron hammer. The, there's just all kinds of evidence that falsify this evolutionary progression and it should not be a surprise because it's not in concrete to start with. It's there to test. Okay, we test. It doesn't work. There are contradictions. A general order as we would predict, but the exceptions falsify the idea that they're segregated by millions of years rather than by habitat. I think Dawkins' criteria is met and it's falsified. He says, if a single well-verified mammal skull were to turn up in 500 million year old rocks, the whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. Well, mammal skull, let's just take a whole mammal. <laughs> Skeleton, 10 humans, not 500 million years, but as he acknowledged even from the Carboniferous, human bones would blow the theory of evolution out of the water. It is falsified by the very criteria criterion that he sets forth. Stephen Stanley, that we referred to earlier, made this statement in detail. And let's conclude looking at what he had to say about it. He talked about the topsy-turvy fossils. Let's look at the context of that statement. He said there's an infinite variety of ways in which since 1859 the general concept of evolution might have been demolished. Consider the fossil record, little known resource in Darwin's day. The unequivocal discovery of a fossil population of horses in Precambrian rocks would disprove evolution. More generally, any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory, yet not a single one has come to light. And of course, won't until he looks. We've invited him to Glen Rose. We've invited him out to Utah. He refuses to come. He continues saying, as Darwin recognized, a single geographic inconsistency would have nearly the same power of destruction. You don't have to have a whole lot. He said just one. Darwin said the same thing. But these are his terms, destroy and disprove. Uh, power of destruction. That's the effect. Blow it out of the water. These are their descriptions of the implications of these finds. And there's lots of it. 
there's much more than a single inconsistency. Nova put it this way when they were talking about the footprints at Glen Rose and the possibility that it indicates man and dinosaur were together. Finding them side by side, what does that mean? Well, finding them, of course, they say there's nothing like it there. They have to because they understand the implication. Finding them would counter evidence that humans evolved long after the dinosaurs became extinct and back up the claim that all species, included man, were created at one time. I think we caught them in the truth. They understand what it means. Well, you can decide for yourself if we have well verified, defined. I think it's as...